for the next few days, we're going to be really looking at this problem right here. And you'll see here soon that this is going to eventually involve us finding roots of functions. And we're going to see a few different ways of doing that in MATLAB. Um, but let's actually first just read this question and then figure out how on earth this could involve finding roots. Okay. So it says determine the mass of a bungee jumper with the drag coefficient of 0.25 kilograms per meter to have a velocity of 36 meters per second after four seconds of free fall. And then note the acceleration of gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay. And so if you've been reading through the book, you've probably seen this equation right here several times. And you can see it depends on a lot of things. It depends on G, the acceleration of gravity, M, the mass of the individual, and then we have the drag coefficient. And then, of course, we have time over here, T. All right, well, let's plug in all the knowns, actually, to begin with. Well, you know, for one, uh, we this part here is actually now what v of 4 v of 4 because we know that again t is 4 but even more so or, or, or in a little bit more detail we actually know what v of 4 is it's this 36 meters per second so I'm going to actually put that in place of v of 4 and then we'll have the square root we know g is 9.81 we don't know the mass. We do know the drag coefficient. Okay. The drag coefficient was 0.25. And then we have times hyperbolic tangent of the square root. And then we have again 9.81. And then times our drag coefficient of 0.25. And then this is all over M, which again is our unknown. And then T, we said was 4. So if you're looking at this equation, you're going to notice we only have one unknown. And that's why I actually went and plugged in all these things individually. So you can see our un only unknown is M, and that's what we're trying to find here. So you can see we could try and use algebra to, to uh, solve for M. I don't know that that's... Uh, possible here and it's and if it if it is it's definitely not going to be fun um, so our other option is we could maybe solve for M numerically okay and so one way that we could do this is we could subtract by 36 on each side I'm gonna do that and just to make my life a little bit easier I'm gonna copy this I'll have to write all that again. Try and insert it there. Okay. And let's do... There we go. minus 36 there we go okay so now we have this equation set equal to zero okay um, if you were maybe taking an algebra class or something like that one approach here would just be to plug this into y1 on your calculator and just find the x-intercept and that's pretty much what we're gonna do here okay you're gonna think about this piece here is just some function okay and it's a function of m so is what we'll really be looking at is just solve some function of m let me write my f there a little bit nicer f of m equal to zero and then we can find the mass okay now uh, let's go ahead and switch to matlab Now that we're in MATLAB is what I'd actually like us to do first. It's just 
let's make an attempt to graph what we are looking at um, in OneNote. Okay, and you can see we have all the same information up here. It's just all commented out. Okay. So the the first thing I'm going to actually have us do is write func because that's what we're going to name our function here. And uh, the purpose for that you'll see here in a minute is that we are eventually going to create a, another function that's going to help us determine kind of where these roots are. Okay, so let's, let's make our function. So func, um, and this is an inline function, so I'm going to need to write at and then our variable. And if you remember from OneNote, the variable that we have here is m. Okay, and... I'm just going to copy and paste this right here. There might be a couple things I have to change, and I'll explain it in a minute, but there we go. And then remember, we had the minus 36. Okay. okay, there we go. So one thing you, you may not be aware of, and um, that's okay, here eventually, th this function that I'm talking about that we're going to create, it's actually right here, it's called incremental search um, it's going to depend on the fact that we're actually plugging in a vector for m and it's not that we you know literally want the input to be a vector in general it's just that when we input this vector it allows us to input lots of different values for m simultaneously okay so right you can right add two vectors you can take the dot product of two vectors um, you can multiply a vector by a scalar. Okay. All those things are okay, but you'll notice if we actually did input a vector here, we'll end up with a vector. And same goes here. You'll have hyperbolic tangent of a vector. Okay. And so what this is going to do is, you, is now you're saying you have a vector times a vector. Okay. And MATLAB's going to see this and try and take the dot product of these two vectors. And the issue is going to be um, that these two vectors have the exact same dimensions. Okay. Um, and so if we wanted MATLAB to actually take their dot product, which we don't, um, we would need to make sure that, you know, uh, they're essentially going to be, we'd have to take the transpose of one of them in order to, to take the dot product. Okay. Now, is what we really want to happen is we'd like to multiply the first entry of the first vector by the first entry in the second vector. And then we'd like to move down a row and now take the second entry of the first vector and multiply that by the second entry of the second vector and so on. And so remember, in order to do that, we just need to put a little dot here in front of our operation. And my mouse is in the way. Okay. And so this should fix our problem. Okay. Now, it's not going to cause us any issues yet. I'm just thinking ahead, and I don't want to forget to put that there. <laughs> um, but let, let's go ahead and plot this so we have some kind of an idea of potentially where this root is. Um, so we're going to need to choose uh, the range of m values that we would like for, for the mass. Okay. And so we could be really general here. We could just maybe say m equals... Um, and we could try, oh, how about, about 0 to 200. Okay. And if this is the wrong range of, uh, if, if this doesn't result in us seeing the root or the, so that we can determine the mass, we'll just adjust this a little bit. Okay. But this is fine for now. Okay. And then how about we say f equals func. Or, or how about even easier? How about we just say Y so there's no confusion? Our Y values are just going to result from plugging in these M values. Okay. And actually, we ended up plugging in uh, a vector sooner than I intended. So it's good that we vectorized this, putting that little dot here. Okay. So we essentially have now our X and our Y values. So we could say plot, and we could do M comma Y. And let's go ahead and hit run, see if we get any error messages. Okay. And we did. And some of you might clearly see why. I have all these variables here, right? And I haven't defined what they are. Okay. 
So I should have g is equal to 9.81, our drag coefficient, which is c sub d, right? Um, that was 0.25, and I believe we had one more. Yeah, t is equal to 4. Now let's try and run it again, see if we get any more error messages. And so, yeah, we are uh, getting... MATLAB is a little upset with us. It's telling us that we, our matrix dimensions don't agree. Okay. And so here's the issue. Um, again, like I pointed out, we need this dot here so that we can actually multiply element-wise each one of these vectors that we have here. But there's something else going on, right? You can technically take a, a, a vector and divide it by a number but a number divided by a vector is not really an operation that, that we have. Okay? So remember, m here is a vector. And I'm saying that I'm going to divide, n, or I'm going to do this number divided by a vector. Okay? But is what I really want to do is I want to take this number, okay? and I want to divide it by all the possible values of m. Okay? So in order to fix this, I need one more little dot here before my operation. And all operations are things like uh, multiplication and division. Okay. This should fix our issue. Okay. There we go. Looking good. And now it might be kind of hard to tell exactly where that root is, but you can see it's somewhere in here in this region. Uh, but if we wanted to, we could actually even add in another line. How about we use hold on and uh, also maybe actually include this other function. This other function, um, we really just want it to be the line uh, y equals zero. Okay. So we could kind of do the same thing here. We could create some other function. Um, So y1 equals 0. Okay. And we want actually a bunch of zeros, don't we? Okay. Um, and I, I actually don't think we need to make that many, but let's make a few. So we have this zeros command. And uh, let's just go ahead and maybe make a... Um, we can actually make a matrix of zeros using this command, but we just need a single vector of zeros. So how about we just say we want uh, 10 zeros. Okay. And up here, why don't we say that uh, our inputs, I'm going to change this actually to y2. Okay. Let's say that our inputs here are just uh, the numbers from uh, 0 to 200, but we'll count by uh, 20s. Now, I might be off by one here. I might have to add an extra zero in here, but we'll find out here pretty quickly. Okay. All right, and we're going to go ahead and plot that. So we have uh, x2, y2. Yeah. See, so yeah, I think I'm just off by one on the zeros because I think x2... Let me show you what I can do here. You can actually see it, the length of x2 um, in our workspace. It says 1 by 11, but you can also check its length using the length function. So I could try and do length x2 and see, oh, this thing is 11. Um, it has 11 entries in it. And so what I'll do is I'll just go up here and change my y2 to zeros 11, so that way I have a vector of 11 zeros. And that fixed our problem. Um, point being, though, we have this line y equals 0, and you can see where the intersection is now, right? Okay. Now, it, it's probably not at exactly 140 here, okay? but you can see it's somewhere nearby. So this is giving us a good idea of where it is, but the question is, is there a more efficient way or, or maybe a more accurate way of determining where that intersection is, okay? 
because um, th this is really what we're trying to solve here, right? Okay. Well, a couple of the methods that we're going to use are called bracketing methods, which means we need to be able to pick a number uh, a little bit to the left and a number a little bit to the right in order to perform those algorithms. Okay. And so graphically, we could probably get that done. But if we'd like a, a, a slightly smaller interval, maybe we could create uh, create a function that will help us bracket where that root is. And all I mean by bracket, again, is finding a point a little to the left, a point a little to the right. Okay. So that's our, our actually next goal, is, is to try and create something that'll do that for us. Okay. So I've switched us over to um, a, another tab in here. And again, you can see it's, it's labeled INC search for incremental search. And this is actually going to be the function that's on page 144. And is what I've done here is I'm going to use the same inputs, the same output. Um, and he here's really the same uh, comments in here as well. Okay. But I want to go through this because I think it can be kind of overwhelming to look at some of these functions for the first time because they're so long. There's so, so much commentary in them. Uh, so we're going to kind of try and build it ourselves here. Okay. So let, let's just start off with saying kind of what these inputs are. So it, one of our inputs is just a function, okay? Like let's say the function that we had in our, our last tab, okay, for the bungee example. And then we're going to start off with saying x min, x max. So kind of like when we were graphing it, we said, well, the mass might be between 0 and 200. We'll just start off with that. And that's essentially what we're saying here as well, okay? except for we're not going to be looking at it graphically. Okay. And then the last thing is this ns, which is our number of subintervals. Okay. And before we move any further in looking at these comments, I want to switch to OneNote real quick. Okay. So essentially is what we're going to wind up doing here is let's say again that we think that the mass is somewhere between 0 and 200 which we've actually already seen it is okay. so here's our, our number line not a straight looking number line but it's a number line and we're going to divide the interval into a bunch of pieces and is what we're going to do is we're going to see if the sign ever changes as we switch, you know, from one interval to the next. Okay. And if that sign does change, that's an indication that we have a root. Okay. And if the sign doesn't change, then there's probably not a root there. Okay. So let's go ahead and go back and we are going to try this out. Um, let's see what else here. So the output you see is XB. So XB is actually going to be a vector that contains the X values where we do end up with the sign change. Okay. And if there is no sign change, XB will just end up being an empty vector. Okay. Let's see if there's anything else in here that I haven't mentioned. I think that's, I think that's everything. Now we are going to use something that we have not seen before. Okay. So it ends up that you, you can adjust your functions so that somebody can use the function without inputting every single input here. Okay. And in order to do that, we're going to use something called Nargan. So I'm going to write if Nargan is less than three. Okay. And so actually, there would be a point to where maybe we have too few input arguments. Okay. Too few input arguments. And that would be the case to where we didn't give it three. We need at least three. Okay. And so the reason we need at least three is we're going to set it so that the default is if you don't input the number of sub intervals, it's automatically going to use 50. But if, again, if, if somebody were to use this function and then not input three things, 
uh, we're going to say, hey, there's, a, there's an issue here. We need to have at least a function in x min and an x max. That's what this next part's going to say. So if Nargan is less than 3, and remember, normally, you know, I, I like to write if statements using separate lines, but if you want it all in one line, we can just use a comma here, and then error. And so this is another function of MATLAB. If you want to display an error, you can actually just write error, write parentheses, and then, of course, we're going to need our quotes. And then you can write whatever phrase you want here. So at least three arguments um, required. Okay. And then that would be the end of that if statement. Okay. So now the next thing is, is we want to set up that default we were talking about. If Nargan is less than four, that's OK. Is what we'll do is we'll just say, let the number of sub intervals equal 50. And then we can end that. All right, and I just kind of want to repeat what we've done here again. So Nargan just means the number of input arguments. Okay? And so we're saying if the number of input arguments is less than three, display an error. If it's less than four, okay, that's OK. We're just going to let the NS equal 50 as the default. Okay. Um, but you could imagine a, a world where maybe you want to increase the number of subintervals. Maybe we're looking um, at a very curvy function. Um, and maybe uh, 50 subintervals isn't enough to capture where that sign change occurs. Okay. Okay, but so we've taken care of the variable number of input arguments. Let's actually start this search. Okay, so I'm going to write in here incremental. Okay, and so. We're going to use the lin space function to divide our sub interval up. Okay. So we have lin space. We're going to have our x min to our x max. Okay. And then we want to tell it how many um, times we want to divide this thing up. So I'm going to say ns. Okay. And so remember, is what this is going to do is this will give us a vector okay, that will start at x min, it'll end at x max. And it will give us, um, if we're using the default, it'll give us 50 numbers. Okay, let me show you. So if we were to do lin space of, oh, how about one to five? And let's say we just wanted it to give us three numbers. There we go. Okay, it gave us three numbers from one to five evenly spaced. Okay. So that's all that does. Okay. The next thing we're gonna wanna do here is we wanna plug these things into the function. Okay. And so is what we're actually gonna wind up doing is we're gonna create a vector, a vector called f, which is gonna be composed of all the function values um, at all these x values. Okay. So right, all these x values that we just created above, we're going to plug into our function, which will create this vector that we're going to call f. Okay. All right, and so then next thing on our list is we need a little bit here before we start setting up our for loop. Okay, so before we actually run all this, right, we haven't had any sign changes yet, and so we're going to use nb to denote our, our sign change. And so right now we haven't had any, so I'm gonna just say NB equals zero. Um, and then the next thing would be our vector XB. So we mentioned that this is gonna contain all the X values where we have a sign change, okay? And so for now, it's gonna be empty, okay? So all this is saying is we have an empty vector, or empty matrix. Um, XB. Okay. And then next on our list, we can finally get into our for loop. So I'm going to say for k equals 1, 2, right? And then the question is to what? 
okay? To what? Let's think about this really basic example we did down here. Okay. So notice we used NS being three here technically, right? And if I were to look for a sign change, I'd be looking for a sign change between one and three. And then I'd be looking for a sign change between five and three. And so that's checking in two, that, that's checking twice for a sign change when NS was three. And maybe we'll do one more kind of example. Um, let's say uh, one to five, but we'll do five this time. Okay, five different numbers. Okay. So if this was our interval, we'd want to check for a sign change between here and here. So that's one. We'd want to check for a sign change here. That's two. We'd want to check one here. That's three. And then we'd want to check one here, which is four. Okay. So if we've checked four times, that's one less than whatever this number was. So is what we'll say is we'll say from one to the length of, and so this would be the length of X minus one. Oop, that's a two. There we go. All right, and then now that we know how many times we're gonna run this for loop, let's actually put in here what we need. Okay. So we're gonna have if, and then we actually have a sign function. We actually don't need this sign function. I'll explain why here in a second, but we're gonna use it anyway. Um, and so is what we'd like to do is we would like to check what the sign is of f at the first x value in this vector. Okay. And so to get the first x value in that vector, I just need f of k, right? f of k is actually going to be the first fun or the first value in this vector that we created. Okay. And is what we'd like to know is is this sign different than the next one? And so the way that we say not equal to in MATLAB here is we're going to need the tilde and then the equal sign. And again, we want to check the sign at the next uh, location here. So that would be F of K plus one. All right, let's go a little further here. So after we check to, to look for a sign change, if we've found one, is what we'd like to do is say that now the number of sign changes is going to increase by one. Okay. This is actually more important for indexing um, our vector that we're gonna create here, or actually I should say matrix, our matrix that we're gonna create here, which is XB and is what we would like to happen is that if this is our first sign change or our nb sign change um, that's what row it'll go in and in the first column okay. and actually before I, I do that i want to point out that we'll also put something in the second column of that same row and is what we're going to put is we're just gonna put the corresponding X values where this sign change occurred. So this is just going to be that leftmost value and then this will be the right value. So X of K and X of K plus one. Okay. So again, that's X of K would be the left point, X of K plus one would be the right point and in between there, the sign has changed. Okay. All right, and I'm gonna suppress each one of these and that actually ends our if statement and then we can end our for loop okay and all we're going to do from here is just add a few more bells and whistles so if um and we have another function here that we haven't seen here is empty so this is saying if um xb is an empty vector we're going to display oops, we're gonna display something, right? Disp, don't forget your quotes in the parentheses though. Um, we are gonna display no brackets found. Really just meaning there was no sign change, okay? And we'll also display some advice, okay? 
that advice being, you know, check interval um, or increase NS. Okay. And so here's the idea. Either we chose a bad interval where a sign change doesn't occur, okay, or we just didn't uh, use enough sub intervals to capture that sign change. Okay. Because again, it might be a very curvy function. Okay. And now if it's not empty, so I'm going to say else, okay, because this is our other option. If it's not empty, we're going to display we want to really display our results here. So first, let's say the words we want, which are number of brackets. Okay. And then right after that, we will display okay, um, NB. Okay. So NB would be our number of brackets. So really the, the number of, or, or sorry, we're not, displaying the number of brackets. We're displaying, uh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. NB would be the number of brackets. And if you're curious where those sign changes occur, you'd want to look at the vector XB. There we go. And so for this if statement, I will also need an end. And that finishes off this function. Let's go ahead and save it. And then we're going to try it out. Okay. I'm going to hit save. And then I'm going to go back to our bungee example. Okay, so we had plotted this to see, you know, where that sign change occurred. Looking at it graphically, the best we could tell, you know, it was around 140, 150, somewhere in there. Okay. I'm going to get rid of some of this because we don't need it anymore. Let's get rid of all that. Okay. So the, the next thing we want to do is, again, use that function. So inc search, okay. incremental search. We want our, we should actually go back so you can see this. If we look at our inputs, our first input should be the function. Okay. And it doesn't have to be named FUNC. I could have named it something else um, in the bungee example file here. And then we'd like our X minimum. Okay. And since we already approximately know where this is happening at, let's just say 100 to 200. And uh, lastly, we could input the number of sub intervals or we can leave it out because we set this up to where if you don't input the number of sub intervals, it'll just use 50. Okay. And I think that'll be plenty. Let's go ahead and hit run. Okay. And so you can see our number of brackets. So this is telling us, hey, there was a sign change. Okay. And then here are the brackets. The sign change happened in between this 140.8163 and 142.8571, okay? And so is what we would do from here, which we don't have it yet, but we're gonna have an algorithm here soon and we'll actually create a function for it that will take these two brackets and it'll zero in on where that intercept is, okay? Because right now this, is, you know, this isn't telling us exactly where that switch has occurred. But do know it, you can, um, you know, add more sub intervals. But right, the more complicated our functions are, and the bigger the interval, and the more sub intervals we use, the longer it's going to take to run. And so, um, getting to here is going to be completely sufficient because we're just going to use a, another function here in a little bit. Okay. But do know you, you could have went 100. And this will shrink those brackets a little bit. The brackets, the, the left endpoint and right endpoint will be even closer together. Okay. And you could keep doing this. Okay. All right. And so that's going to be the end of this video. And in our next video is what we'll do is we'll actually um, come up with one of those techniques for, you know, zeroing in on, on the intercept, not just bracketing it.